driver's license, even though it's an expired license, they wouldn't let her get her either her ID card or her driver's license today because she only has a paper copy. The only, the only out that we can see for her is to I've learned a lot about what it means to or why this is Idaho. doesn't work for people who have a driver's license. No. It is shocking it's to more than the state We're stipulations. And actually, we should sit down with her and and to get ID in Oregon. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more than ridiculous. It took us a month and a half to get her out of Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. It's just been. Would you like me to tell Carl? No! Carl heard us. Carl. <laughs> Yay, Thank Carl. You, Carl. And people out there in the community, uh, welcome to the our work session. The mayor is away at a conference. Um, so the council president chairing in his stead, and we'll start the meeting with the introduction of our new assistant city manager. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Come on up! Yes. So... Candy cane. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't show on the TV. It might. <laughs> uh, so... I wanted to welcome Kelly and give you guys a chance just to say hello. Uh, she started yesterday. We've basically dumped a whole lot of information on her for the last 24 hours, Four and she's... I believe you've been dumping information on her for a month. Or for a while. <laughs> true. That's true. But yeah. she had to spend in two hours with us in her room, and she kept going, what else am I missing? Because it was all in one project. So uh, do you want to say a little bit about you? Sure. Um, well, I think you guys, I was here before when I worked for the state, um, and so I've met a lot of you all before. Um, it's really exciting. This is a great, I'm really excited about this opportunity, um, and uh, and I have been diving right in on all this safe program work and have, having Chuck explain everything to me, really having everyone explain everything to me about how the city operates and what our deadlines and schedules are, are right now and see how I can be most helpful. So I just ask that you're patient with me as I as I learn uh, and also just feel free to call or email or whatever you want to do at any time uh, the more I learn from you all I, I think some of you may even be getting some tour requests soon so that I can actually go out and look at things firsthand and learn that way as well so um, that's not a lot about what I did before but I think you probably know all that um, for the you can give us a thumbnail yeah. for the audience. Yeah. Okay, audience. Uh, so um, for the past seven years, I've been with the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation. I started off as the government liaison. So it's the regional government affairs person. And in that capacity, I just spent a lot of time kind of working with our stakeholders on kind of selecting projects. So you know, Connect Oregon grants, um, you know, STIP pro projects, and just doing kind of day-to-day -day triaging of issues. So you want a school zone on this highway, you know, kind of thing. You want a new sign for Happy Valley. I spent a lot of time <laughs> working with Happy Valley, if anyone's listening, on their signs. Uh, so that kind of stuff. And then uh, three years ago, I stepped into the policy and development manager role, which oversees planning and major projects and the capital program uh, and the government relations as well. So there I got to just do all that fun kind of front end work. So work on the plans that help identify the projects and help find the money for those projects, scope them, and figure out what they cost, uh, and then send them off to project delivery to get them constructed. So right before I left, I was spending a lot of time on I-205, Rose Quarter, um, starting to work on the congestion pricing work. Uh, so pretty busy on the on some big stuff. Uh, but uh, and I I loved it actually. I I uh, I was not necessarily. Uh, trying to leave, I was having a, a pretty good time, but this uh, presented a really great opportunity for me to, you know, work with you all. I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening in this community right now, uh, and to work on some different things. You know, work on not just transportation, uh, but parks and economic development and a whole host of other issues. So, uh, anyway, thanks again for having me. Um, Excited to be here. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. Very excited. And just so people know, uh, Kelly's main focus is going to be working with engineering right now, just trying to get safe and SSMP and that whole bonding conversation pulled together. Uh, she is only part time this month, so if you don't hear from her, it's because she is not here, probably for a couple of weeks going into the holidays. Uh, and then on January 2nd, she'll start full time. 
Uh, she's also going to be working with our events team and with our PIO and with that team just to my office basically running the city manager's office and making sure that that team has the resources it needs. And Kelly's now going to dance. <laughs> I was dancing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then she's also going to be taking on parks. So Stefan is here tonight. He is helping yeah. her learn the parks and connect with Barb okay. and sort of make those connections so that's an easier transition to go through uh, once he transitions out and she is full time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. You're going to be busy. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I don't think anybody's bored on the staff no, here. No. I doubt that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Call anytime. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Welcome. Okay. So next we have Haley and Brandon to talk about replacing the phone system. And that was his question. Yeah. 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 Pardon? Replacing the phone system and network equipment. Network equipment. Okay. Meaning phone network or meaning oh. internet. Meaning like computer network, but computer. I'm gonna let our <laughs> <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> so our I think that you alluded to networking phone replacement. Um, our network equipment is about time to be replaced. We've run into an issue recently where we can't update it, which makes it a concern for us, especially from a network security issue. Mm -hmm. um, Along with that, we've been hearing a lot of complaints about the phone system in general that the city uses. Uh, it's really meant for call centers um, and not so much for back office systems. Uh, and so when we were going out and getting quotes for the network equipment, the company said, hey, we can also give you a separate quote for the phone system. I said, why not? And now it's turned into it's actually a feasible project through um, CIP combination and budgetary savings in the IT budget that we can cover the costs. Do you want to give a brief description of network based on Lisa's question? <laughs> yes. So network, computer network, um, it's basically what, what everything's plugged into as far as either it's a printer, a desktop computer, our phones, um, cameras, um, building automation systems, a lot of things depend on our network in order to operate and function. Um, along with that, we're also replacing our Wi-Fi network, which has been not very good for us for over the past couple of years. So um, we're looking at replacing that as well, and that's all part of the quote. So through this one company, we got two quotes, and everything is should be covered for quite a while after this. And that includes the new library? That will include equipment for the new library. We're not basing our replacement schedule on when the library will close. We'll just replace the equipment, and when the library moves, we'll pull that equipment out and put it into the uh, temporary location and pull it out and move it back. And it, when you say network, is there one place that there's a network in one room, or is, does each building and each facility have a network room? Each building in the facility, each facility has a room uh -huh. that contains network equipment. Uh -huh. um, in City Hall, we take up a, a rather large portion. Um, we're able to minimize that down greatly once we replace the equipment. And that's just due to technology. It's, constantly shrinking, which is kind of nice. Um, our main network place is at the police station, public safety building, and then um, we use our uh, Johnson Creek facility as an emergency backup, mostly because of events that could happen. And generally we refer to these rooms as server rooms versus network rooms, so it's where you have all your servers. And there would actually be a cost saving in doing this, correct? And would it come out of IT budget? Yes, there will be um, reduced cost with the maintenance. Uh, with, for example, the estimated cost that we have right now for maintenance of our of the replacement network equipment and phone system is actually a little bit less than what we're paying for maintenance on our current phone system. Just for maintenance. Just for maintenance. Wow. Yeah. What did you pay for your maintenance for the phone system? Uh, it was twenty six thousand. Um, I got that reduced down to nineteen thousand for this year, and then for our network equipment, we're looking at about seventy two hundred. 
Well, and their projected, the calculation is projected to go up. The phone maintenance is projected to go up 25% a year. So it's at 20 now, and it was supposed to go up 25% year over year, is what we've been told. So mm -hmm. all of that's additional savings. Uh, can I, um, on the 234000 that's been approximately saved, how have how we done that? Um, I've done that through eliminating contracts that we weren't using, um, underperforming or non-performing vendors. Uh, we got rid of the contract on that one. Um, a lot of it came from the initial replacement of the phone system um, due to staff turnover. The old phone lines from CenturyLink were never canceled. So we were paying for two sets of phone lines, one from our current vendor and one for CenturyLink. And so I worked for CenturyLink, with CenturyLink for the past year to eliminate a great chunk of that. And that was, um, we reduced about 4,000 a month uh, just through CenturyLink. The short answer great. is that Brandon's amazing. Yeah, great work. Yeah. <laughs> it's been really substantial. There's also like a, a, a contract was structured and several so basically we just came in and reviewed all of our ongoing contracts I and have been able to make find efficiencies there. Why did we have a phone system in the beginning that was designed for a call center? Technology changes. Uh, it was it, it's it does a lot in one package. Um, it just does too much in one package, which overly complicates everything. Um, for example, to make a transfer, you have a transfer button on your phone, but you can't actually press it. You have to use your phone client and pop it up and drag and drop and do all these other things. And I've actually never learned how to use phone client. <laughs> It's an awesome system, it's just not built for what we need it for. Yeah. Right. So it saves staff time as well. Yes. So is it me buying all new phones too? Yes, and that's part of the, the That's quote. part of the whole package? Yes, we are able to um, not replace certain devices um, that are in shared spaces that don't actually have a person associated with them, so like in lunch rooms or break rooms or any of these other rooms. So we're able to reuse our old phones to uh, just realize a little bit more savings in the replacement because they don't need to be fancy anything. They just need to be able to pick up, have a dial tone, make a phone call, and be done with it. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who have a phone number here, but we just get it on our email, we'll still get it on our email? Yes. And, <laughs> and one of the, the things that, that should be demoed tomorrow for the uh, management and director staff is it should do voice to text. Mm -hmm. So when you get the voicemail, you'll get the voice call, but it should also um, sure. give you a text of what was said. It's, Pretty good. As much as it can interpret. Yeah. yeah. My phone. Those can also be hilarious. Yeah, yes. I get some of those from yeah, so we'll yeah, see how well the internet, that goes. which are funny. Google, yeah. Google Voice or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? For so right now, yeah. they need to bring this forward on consent for approval um, at the next meeting. So if you have any other direction, um, we get to All right. Good work. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Keep saving us money. I like yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Now we get to the 100 and 200 page packet. Yeah. <laughs> I told Anne if I ever had insomnia, that was a packet to me. <laughs> she thought it was brilliant and wonderful. It was work. brilliant and wonderful. Work. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. We keep you riveted. Where do you want? Do you want to over there? Do we need a chair to Okay, so oh, Kelly is Kelly. handing out the things that were identified on the staff report as to be presented. So I believe that includes a memo from Jordan Ramis, um, which talks about methodologies of maintaining your purchasing rules, basically. And then it, 
always talking to this thing. Um, it includes the draft federal procurement standards that we are um, So we came before you guys last in August, September, September, to talk about how we wanted to approach moving forward in this process. Um, and staff recommendation and the direction we got at that time was to move forward with taking our local procurement goals as they were and editing those to be um, compliant in, where, in areas where staff noted we were uncompliant with Oregon revised statutes and model rules. And, um, and then we needed to add these federal procurement standards. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to let Kelly talk a little bit more about the analysis side of things um, and just changes, um, kind of the rationale for the changes we've presented. Basically, um, this will end up being a multi-stage process. Um, as many as people identified in September, this is a much bigger undertaking than maybe staff had originally anticipated. So um, one of the things you will note that we have not addressed at all is the inclusionary type statements because we know that's a big priority for council and we want to do it right. But there are there are some good examples on how to do this, but it's very comprehensive. And so um, we would like to take the time necessary to do that right. And there are very various implications with that. If you put in local preference, there are ways that that can be negative to our businesses and that other businesses might have a reciprocation thing in which they dis they make it they get negative points actually if they get preference in our area. So there's a lot of things like that that we didn't want to um, that we wanted to just be really intentional about addressing. So those are not included in the proposals currently. Um, but what we have said is that we will actually, what we're proposing now is to come back in July with a work plan on how maybe we can detail or how we come back to you with those because over the next six months we have um, the CRP and the safe and the budget to get off the ground and so we want to again take the right amount of time to do those. So these changes are, um, will get us in more compliance. Thanks. Um, so yeah, like Haley said, for the past few months we've been uh, meeting with uh, staff uh, here at the city, um, and you guys have the um, initial workup as well, um, and just kind of going over what, at least what feedback I've received over the last four years that I've been doing this, as well as, like Haley said, things that we were aware that we were in compliance with. Um, so some of the items that you'll see here, we just went through the document and replace the work shower as so, well, um, just to kind of move that to a more modern American strict rule. Um, again, we've updated these rules for a while, so um, we thought that would be a little more cohesive with what the intent is that we're asking both what the city's responsible as well as what our contractor is responsible for. Um, another big thing that we weren't in compliance with that we needed to bring ourselves up to was qualification-based selection. Um, so that's with personal services like architect, engineering, attorney, accountant, those types of professional services. And specifically with architect and engineering, if we go out for a solicitation, we cannot consider price as a criteria for selecting. Um, and so we needed to make sure that our rules were very clear on that so that we weren't. You mean under some statute. kind of law we're not allowed to? State law. Really? Or yeah. Yeah. Yep. Can wow. we consider um, Architects price? Really good attorneys in legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Until after you've selected yeah. your um, consultant based solely on their qualifications and their experience, then you negotiate price from there. So wow. that's what we were updating there. Um, now with so that the being said. Is done for you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was just speaking with yeah. my legislator this morning. I might have. <laughs> oh, well. may have to go back with this one. Don't yeah. worry, she knows. <laughs> she, yeah. But with that, with that specific rule, there's a separate section for other personal services or professional services like an attorney or a CPA um, where they also have a selection procedure, but price can be um, included as your selection criteria. So again, just making sure that we were very clear on depending on what you're soliciting or what you're going out for, so that's clear. Um, the other thing that we are proposing to update is our small procurement 
currently we sit at five thousand. Um, we're proposing to increase that to ten thousand dollars. So what that means is anything under ten thousand dollars, we can just make that purchase without getting quotes, without doing a competitive process, um, while still trying to be as competitive and fair as possible. So is that the same thing as sole source when it he talks about it's a different thing? It is the same thing. as sole source. A sole okay. source would be there is only one firm that does and, X. Yeah, firm or, or person that can provide the good or service that you need. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes quite a bit of, of research and documentation to come to that conclusion. It's pretty rare. Yeah. Sole source should be pretty rare. Um, so yeah, this would just be, oh, I need, um, I need to buy a box of pencils. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so uh, we can just go out without having to go through a full procurement process. Um, but the state updated this small procurement limit about three or four years ago. So again, it's just kind of bringing that up, and that does not help. Um, I think our our methods. <laughs> and our and then, so in what we put out there, will we say? Ten thousand dollars, or will we say to the maximum allowed under state law? Right. Oh, as far as like how the rule will read, uh -huh. so that we're not limited. So that when the if state it changes, raises it again right? in five years, and we don't want to rewrite our oh, rule. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this point, we just proposed to change it from five to ten, but we did discuss that so that we weren't held to it. Right. This issue of we taking three years to get our rules updated. <laughs> Right. Um, ideally, we would have more and more references to the ORS so that we could. But um, would you guys prefer that language? Then it is whatever the state goes to as that small level, then the city could be compliant. So we can change that for the 19th. I mean, I Does don't... our lawyer see a downside to doing that? Yeah. Like, well, really, I mean, it's more efficient unless you are suspicious of the numbers the state uses or, or not responsible in our context, then it seems to be a pretty efficient way to do it. And we could always address it then. Right. 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 We could always change it to be a right. specific right. number. Right. If you're really happy with the state, you can take action. Yeah. So the only thing I don't like about yeah. referring to state law is that the state law numbers change sometimes mm -hmm. sure. the, the, the section changes and so you you're here as you say in your code as ORS 264 says and then it's not 264 in the future and that creates confusion mm -hmm. and if we're willing to address it when the state changes the value why couldn't we address changing our code at that same point sure. to change the value I don't know how high the state will go but for smaller jurisdictions I think they're a little more cautious on how much they're willing to do in a non-competitive bid procurement than maybe some bigger jurisdictions will do even if the state allowed it. Yeah. So I guess I, I'm not married to not doing a specific dollar amount, but the approach that you've taken historically is to have your own rules and it makes these decisions and when you're still on that path. This memo says there are other ways to do it, uh, but that's the course we're on now. So we'll be consistent with that. Yeah. And you make a good point, you're saying you're, you're right. I mean, it would take a lot more administrative effort to make sure that all reference documents that we provide, you know, in our, that tie to these public contracting rules are current and up to date. But, well, yeah, if you cross reference specific yeah. sections, if you say RS blah, 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 but what if you just say maximum state law, state law, state up to the maximum law. allowed under state, state law, law, and you don't say without, it. Yeah, without referring to the lawyers. And so if that's the case, and that's okay too, but then you are taking the decision making out of our hands and you are allowing the state to determine what those limits would be, which is well, okay. Well, but like Angel law. said, we could always, if we think they go too far, we can always, or a future council we can, can always. Right. Yeah. So it would get out of there. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of. Doesn't um, sound like do we have. Do you want us to bring back proposed languages for both options, or do you have a preference? <laughs> I don't feel strongly about it, just it's the. Constantly. I'm just trying to avoid having, like you said, the three year gap again. And, you know, right. And that's, to me, it makes more sense to say as per state law without referring to ORS mm -hmm. yeah. and and uh, it's because of what you're state, stating that they don't have that lag. It's like it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so some of the other things that we um, proposed here um, were, well, we have, over the past 
um, so I can go back to at least the last six years, we've adopted three amendments that directly affect um, our current rules. So those amendments were incorporated in just as part of the language. Um, one of them was related to the exemption for uh, real property and, and development agreements. Um, there was a, another one that was for architect and engineering amendments uh, to contracts. And then um, there was another one as well. But those were incorporated in as they've already been adopted, but it just kind of makes the document whole. We have also a proposed to uh, public contracting rule number 40 to adopt the Oregon Standard Specifications for Construction, uh, which is a document that's public, published by ODOT. Um, and so what you'll see in the draft is that we've basically striked everything in 40 and uh, replaced it with some language that then references to uh, the Oregon Standard Specifications for Construction document, um, which is its own set of rules. And I don't know, Chuck, if you want to speak a little bit to our reasoning for that and if it brings us compliant. So we've had some, notice some discrepancies between all of our contracts in the past between what we have in the public work standards versus what's in the procurement rules versus uh, we currently actually defer to the Oregon standard specifications for anything that isn't covered. Um, that sets up some conflicts during um, claims specifically and related around contracts. So um, I've actually, uh, I don't know, if Know, but I've sat on the steering committee that wrote these rules between ODOT and the APWA when we put these into effect. And so these are the kind of the compilation of all of the various effort that's gone over the last few years to get the cities on a standardized set of construction specifications so the contractors know their rules from place to place. It was actually a legislative effort. Um, the legislature um, propose that APWA and ODOT get together to set and create these rules, similar to WASHDOTs. Um, whereas WASHDOT mandated it, ODOT, or the Oregon legislature, held a little bit closer to that. But what it does do is it does exactly what we were talking about in some of the other references. Since ODOT's charged to make sure that that is in compliance with the DOJ's model rules, they send out updates every time something changes, so we don't have to worry about that massive construction document and how it relates to, especially in construction industry claims, right, um, for delay claims, any other kind of claims. So it handles all those issues. Uh, there are a few issues that our rules had that it doesn't handle, and that's why you'll see those still sitting in for um, those are things that are not inside the Oregon standard specifications. Uh, so we felt they were important to at least keep. So that's kind of one of the ways I wanted to get to there to get to more uniform. Uh, and I mean, to be a little bit selfish, I'm extremely familiar with these, so <laughs> it makes it not nice as <laughs> compared to ours. <laughs> no, it's not um, if it's selfish. <laughs> the expertise is needed. Is there an example that you have recently with like the, where the conflict is? Um, we've always had conflicts in insurance. Um, we've always had conflicts in how calendar day extensions are granted, um, especially around weather-related delays. Um, uh, there is quite a bit of difference between the various sets of specifications. Uh, usually it's, I mean, it's usually not our issue. It's usually a contractor assuming they're following these and they look at ours and ours are totally different. So we say, yeah, sorry, I mean, this is what you signed your contract on. Okay. Um, so it does kind of get us into the same things. These are actually not ODOT's specifications, the 100s. They're what they call their local public agency specifications. They're designed for local agencies. So they've stripped out a lot of the stuff that ODOT does like statistical analysis of materials and things like that that are extremely labor intensive. So they've been stripped down and put together specifically for public agencies. If you're a certified public agency, you're required to use these. Uh, 
And then the other thing we have noted that we um, incorporated, which was one of the documents I handed you uh, before we got started, is our federal requirements for the Office of Management and Budgets uh, to CF, CRF Part 200. Um, so we had kind of discussed this a little bit at the last session that um, OMB has required by December 25th for us to incorporate some federal requirements into our contracting rules um, so that we are compliant and that we are procuring for goods or services that in whole or in part include some federal funding. Um, so again, that's just bringing our rules up to date. So these have to be enacted this month? Those have to be in active, yeah, by December. So they're going to be on our next agenda. So they will be incorporated yeah. into all, the next, Actually, all yeah. of the proposed changes we're proposing tonight in the rules are set to come before you on the night. Oh, for okay. Including and then what you have in your hands. the work plan for the additional updates would come later. Okay. But these are what we were proposing to do. Do we not have the this, do we not have any federal stuff right now, and we're adding it, or do we have some that it's, it's conflicting with what the change law has been at the federal level? There's next to nothing in our rules at this point. If there's any reference, it's referencing that the contractor will follow state, local, and federal rules. Um, but this is kind of for us as well as the contractor when we have a contract where federal funds are involved that we have to have some language in there, specific policies and procedures that we follow that are, that are in not in conflict, but that we don't have in our rules right now. There was a number of things that we already have in our rules, same types of procedures and, and selection criteria, things like that. So we didn't need to duplicate that because we already followed that. This is the additional stuff that that we'll need in there. Right, so again, we're, looking, we're trying to do that rep, the referencing and to minimize duplication even within our own rules. So um, the attorneys will also be providing comments, but um, our updated rules as proposed meet most of the specification standard, the federal specifications. Um, so we didn't do duplicate listing that. Actually, some of our local standards are more conservative, and so as long as they're more conservative, the statement we put at the beginning of the federal ones is that whichever rules the federal or the cities, whichever ones are more conservative, will be followed, um, unless they're in conflict, and then with federal funds, federal rules. And again, those statements are allowed by ORS, but we're not anywhere in our rules. So, um, these are adding that. Uh, and again, this is so that deadline relates to the uniform guidance. So the federal government, the Office of Management and Budget, went through a whole process of looking at all of their cost principles and consolidating them. And so the requirement that local jurisdictions have federal rules in their own rules just came out with that uniform guidance, which was issued in 2014. And that had an implementation period of which of getting the mature rules of this December 25th. So um, historically, we haven't had as much federal funds as we are having now. But we also, the feds also didn't have that requirement to incorporate some of the rules. It's just that grant managers knew that you had to follow whatever was in the grant documents, and it kind of trumped that way. Um, so there's a little bit of background <laughs> why this is coming up now. This was one of the things that pulled out in our federal audit too, right? During yes. the so we had a capacity audit from the IG's office, the Attorney General's office, um, for the FEMA grant, and we were basically, uh, which we got a clean opinion on, but mostly because um, we have good controls in place, but we don't have a lot of program documents, and that check and I were very knowledgeable about the federal requirements, and that we were, knew we had to get these rules in here. So because the deadline wasn't there, we weren't out of compliance, but we said we would be doing this. So again, that's just some of the things um, that we did. Um, but as Haley mentioned earlier, a lot of these changes are, are doing one of two things. They're either bringing us into compliance based on statute, um, or 
while they're still currently, while they're compliant with statute, maybe they provide some more administrative um, assistance with our internal procedures. Um, so like the small procurement going from five to 10, is it required? No, would it help in, in doing public procurements? Yes. Um, so it's gonna fall under one of those two things. Uh, but again, we did not do a line-by-line -line analysis of all our current rules compared to, to statute. That is something that would be proposed later, as Haley mentioned, with our work plan. And so that kind of leads into the memo that uh, Jordan Raymond had proposed. Um, we had been in contact with Jordan Raymond as to our process, and I come to you guys um, with the recommendation to use our own rules, but we had mentioned broad rules in the original. That said, we um, were considering more of like a straight statute type implementation versus the model rules um, that are issued by the uh, Department of Justice. Um, the ORS does say that you are supposed to compare the changes, so legislature makes changes to the statutes and then the um, Department of Justice is supposed to review those after every state legislature and if they believe changes to the model rules have to happen, they issue updates to the model rules. And ORS says we can opt out of model rules, but that we should be looking at the Department of Justice updates and compare, seeing if our rules that need to be updated. This is probably something we have not been doing on a regular basis, considering that the last substantial update that we had to these rules was in 2006. We have had some amendments, but we haven't done a comprehensive look. And that was one of the things the attorney brought up was that this still was more of where staff was aware that we weren't compliant or making recommendations, but we have not gone line by line through a comparison of the model rules. Um, and that should be part of uh, an update that we do as we go forward. And on that, there's also considerations of other methods to updating those rules. So I don't know if you want him to speak to that or if you just want a chance to read his memo outside of this. Well, so I'll speak to it. I'm going to say, let's get through the uh, nutshell, <laughs> yeah. the nutshell uh, version. Yeah. Yeah. The memo is probably more relevant to what you decide to do in the future than this particular uh, consideration. You're really on a path of taking custom tailored rules and update, and that's the path you're on. The memo suggests there's some other ways you could do that. Essentially, in Oregon, there are three choices. One is that you can adopt the model rules that are prepared by the AG's office. They're designed to be updated to fit the law every time the law changes. And so they're convenient from the sense that you always know you're in compliance. They're difficult for some local governments to use, though, because they're not the most user-friendly um, of a document and uh, unlikely that they would address all the particular circumstances that over the years we've learned we need to deal with. So it's not always the best solution, but it's one that's available. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is to completely draft your own, which is sort of where we were at. In, in fact, we didn't really do that. I, I think what we did was take a probably a dozen years ago or so, take a League of Oregon Cities document and adjust that. The third option is sort of a hybrid where you um, adopt the state version where it fits your needs and then craft your own provisions where that works best. And that's really the more typical approach. And there are a number of different ways to do that. The League does an update regularly that you can use as a template. Uh, Metro's gone through a process that I thought was pretty interesting where they have written a lot of their own provisions, but they use the numbering system from the state system so that it's really easy, not easy, but really easy, but it's, it's more convenient in terms of comparing what you've got to what the state updated. So that, that's a nice format. But those are considerations, I think, in the future on how you decide to do it. Which do you see as more common? I think the hybrid is more common. I think uh, a number of jurisdictions take the league effort, which is designed to be in compliance, and then tweak that to meet their own needs. How often does the league update? It, it does that every couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there occasionally they may miss it, but usually. 
So if you were recommending the procedure of the three, would you say? I would, I would do a hybrid, and I would be very intrigued with uh, using the numbering system that Metro used, just because of the convenience of binding changes. I think that would be too. And I think in terms of the process you're on, it's useful to think of this as a phase or sort of a rolling update, part of it now, part of it's going to come later. By the time we get to the end, we will have done all the line-by-line -line analysis necessary. Uh, so we're getting there, but we keep going to get there. Um, and you've got some innovative staff, Chuck's idea of putting these uh, state uh, standards in the rules. That's a new wrinkle for me. I haven't seen that in other jurisdictions. So we're, we're looking at that. We're having our construction litigators look at some of these changes to make sure that we understand how they work. Okay. Questions before I ask? I was going to say, I, I did not understand that this was coming back on our December 19th agenda, so I did not read these as closely as I would have. Had I, under, I thought it was just sort of a general update on where the process was. So I definitely have to read them more closely and get any comments to you guys. So given that we were, and given that we just came out the federal side, um, we were hoping that we would be able to, can we ask for comments um, back by either Friday or Monday if so that we can get the updated those comments integrated into the draft packet for the 19th. Um, is that reasonable to ask of? If we receive a number of them, if it looks like there are substantial policy changes that you guys would like to discuss, the alternative is that we can notice the study session with a further discussion of this item. But in order to know that, I'd have to know at the latest 24 hours in advance. I mean, it's pretty hard for us to amend it any shorter than that. So I'd say if you could do it by Friday so that we could then have the weekend to notice the meeting change if we need to. Oh, you're talking about Tuesdays. The if work you wanted to, if you guys have substantial session, okay. changes that you want to talk okay. about, okay. I want to make sure you have that time. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try by Friday, but Monday is okay. really more, <laughs> more realistic, <laughs> more realistic okay. for me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Personally, would. Since we're on a path and a work plan and then we're coming back in July, yeah. I think it's critical to get these, well, we have to get some of the federal yeah. one that can be done. Yeah. And, and then we can spend more time really going more line by line because it may be that we are choosing to go a hybrid path and then I don't want to spend, uh, so yeah. spin our wheels on this, which this is not going to be the product of. Staff would right? deeply appreciate that trajectory <laughs> and it would allow us to hit federal requirements and still give you guys time to talk as we assess some of these bigger pieces. Some of those things are like the diversity standards that we're putting into place. So that's really where more of the bigger policy nutty issues are. Mm -hmm. These are federal requirements we have to get in. Yeah. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense from our your staff has been under a lot of uh, pressure created by deadlines and, and to have the opportunity to kind of take this mm -hmm. in a phased way makes mm -hmm. sense. And we did clearly put in the red lines to get this for big groups mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then provide comments by Monday so we can incorporate. But that means we won't be setting time yeah. to discuss. We'll just, yeah. if you see clerical issues or if you have a concern you want to work directly with staff on that you think is intent around language, I think that's probably useful to make sure we don't accidentally pass something in the law that could cause problems. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I, I like the idea if you're willing to do it, to come back and have any policy discussions in July. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are also Thank planning you. to... Um, have the resolution drafts in the packet that Scott sends out next Tuesday. So you see the resolution a week before, a full week before. So you could get us comments during the week if you want us to make edits before we bring the final version, before we adopt it. Um, anything else? And uh, in the next two weeks, if you wanted to schedule time to sit with me or Kelly or both of us to answer question type stuff versus something that needs to be discussed with you, I'm more than happy to schedule that. Absolutely. Okay. Well, it's not, yeah, it, I think the point is, yeah, there's probably not a lot of policy stuff in here that is going to bear a lot of discussion anyway. I, there's some, you know, I'm, I've been a federal government lawyer for 25 years, and there's a reason I avoid the government <laughs> <laughs> But if you want to try 
and sleep this weekend. Feel free to get into the details associated with each piece. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything right. else? Thank you. So much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. It's a lot of work. Yeah. All right. Layla's gonna show us all the craziness of South Downtown. Um, get ready. Are you looking at the screen for this? Yeah, I'm gonna actually have it. Oh, good. I like movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of probably a Keystone Cops kind of a movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. too. It's a map build. It's not that exciting. <laughs> and and you had asked me to give an update on food cart pods. You have me do that before or after? After is great. Okay. Thanks. Did not forget. Afternoon. Um, I'm here today with Chuck and Jennifer, and we are going to talk you through um, our proposed approach to implementing a whole bunch of projects in South Downtown. Um, so we have been coordinating pretty much since I started here um, in August. Um, we realize there's a number of projects happening in the downtown area, both public and private. And so this is a really great opportunity for us to collaborate interdepartmentally. Um, so that's one of the main thrusts of this work. Um, but the intent of this coordination is really, it's multifaceted. Um, what we want to do is implement projects in a way that are efficient and cost effective. Um, we want to limit the impacts of street closures, of which there will be some. Um, and we wanted to develop a comprehensive traffic control plan as well. And then I think most importantly, we wanted to really understand the extent, the timing, the phasing of all of these projects together so that we could communicate effectively with the public and with the businesses about what is going to be happening um, in South Downtown. And then finally, I think one of the major drivers here is to ensure that the farmer's market and the plaza are completed in the spring of 2019, which is when we also anticipate um, the Guardian redevelopment project to be completed, as well as um, the work that's going on in Milwaukee High School and so forth. So where this all comes from is we know that there's a number of projects in downtown, both private and publicly driven. So uh, we anticipate uh, Guardian redevelopment of Bernard's Garage to begin construction sometime this spring, also to be completed, completed in May of 2019 is what we're expecting. Um, we are also working on Coho Point at Kellogg Creek, so just right across the street. Uh, we have Milwaukee High School redevelopment, which will be kicking off here uh, this summer. They'll be starting to move um, their high school into the football field in June. And then we also have the Northland Housing Alternatives Project, which is just right next door as well. So we thought we should sit down and talk and see what else is going on in the city. Um, and also just to note, even though it's a little bit more north, but the Letting Library is on the same timeline as these projects as well. Um, so as we sat down as a team, we went through a pretty comprehensive um, look at our CIP and a number of the projects we were working on, and this represents a summary of uh, the major uh, city-led projects that will be happening in South Downtown. And I just want to clarify, when I'm talking about South Downtown, I'm really referencing everything south of Washington to where Lake Road um, begins. So all of this stuff is happening right there. Um, so one of the main drivers is the main, is the main street underpass of the UPR and the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail. So we have some resources for that. That needs to be substantially complete by summer. Um, we have the Washington and Main Storm sewer pipe replacement. So as we started talking as staff about all the projects that were on the horizon, this one was actually programmed out um, in the CIP a couple of years, and we thought it makes sense to move that up since we'll be tearing out the street to put in the farmer's market infrastructure to build South Downtown Plaza. And we'll also be providing utilities to adjacent development as well in this time frame. And then um, we'll be taking 
taking on uh, undergrounding of remaining utility poles on Maine and Washington. And then we can top it all off with a rebuilding of Maine and Washington streets, including um, building the sidewalks and, uh, and repaving doing all of that work. So that's a nice list, but I always find that it's easy to look at things. Uh, it's nicer to be able to look at things in, in a visual way so that we can actually see what we're, we're doing. And this has really been helpful for us. So as we started to go through this exercise, I took all of those projects, I mapped them out, and then we as a team have sat down several times now and have developed a phasing strategy to implement all of these projects over the next year and a half. Um, it's a substantial undertaking, but I think we believe we can do it if we are focused and prioritized and um, really um, stick to the schedule. So what we've done is we've divided this up into um, three phases. Um, phase one is south of the post office, and I'll walk you through all the improvements that were um, that will be there. And then phase two is the most complex and the longest. Um, so we'll walk you through each phase of that. Um, we have phase 2.1, which we're calling uh, it's 21st in Washington. So we actually need to bring over the, the storm pipe from the west east side of 21st through the intersection. Um, so there's a little dance there that we have to do in terms of traffic control, but we have some thoughts about that. Um, so it's both storm and sewer pipes? It's just storm. Just storm. Sewer was done a few years back. Yeah. Okay. And water is okay. also good. And then North Washington is the final phase. So. So phase one, south of the post office. So we anticipate kicking this off spring of 2018. Um, design is underway and for a lot of these elements, and we expect that construction timeline to be about four months. Um, the first thing that we will do is the underpass. Um, <coughs> then the next phase, once that's complete, we'll rebuild the street and then we'll put in the sidewalks. And so during this time frame, uh, everything south of the post office um, will we'll have access to the post office will be closed to Lake. So that section of Maine will be closed for four months, um, basically spring to summer of next year. Phase two is north of the post office to Washington. So we'll reopen uh, Main Street so that there is access from Lake to get to the post office, but everything north of that will be closed but for local traffic um, so that folks can get down to Bloom and Broken Arrow um, and have access to those businesses. So again, it's gonna be an, an, a timing and uh, I think a lot of art going into how we orchestrate um, all of these improvements. Um, we expect this timeline to take about 15 months, um, and I'll walk you through that again, uh, but we expect to start that summer, late summer of 2018, finish up early summer of 2019. So the first phase of this, we'll start with the storm uh, pipe down Washington and Maine. Um, then the next phase will be including, starting to develop the, uh, the utility step outs that will be necessary for um, the redevelopment of Bernard's Garage as well as Coho Point. So we'll have to kind of figure those things out um, pretty soon and get those in line. Um, the next phase is these are the four poles that will be remaining after all of the other poles are put underground with other projects. So the rebuilding of the underpass will be undergrounding um, utility pole there. Guardian redevelopment project will also be undergrounding the utility poles that are near their site. So that leaves us with four. Um, we'll be undergrounding the rest of those with uh, this project. And then we'll be putting in our festival street or our farmer's market infrastructure. So this is the water, the electrical, everything that we're um, putting in place to move and relocate the farmer's market here. Um, developing the South Downtown Plaza. So we'll be building that as well. And then we repave and we rebuild all the sidewalks with the goal being that the infrastructure is in place for the farmer's market opening in May of 2019. And is, we, and is that in any way, sorry, oh, go ahead. is that in any way, do you feel that's overly aggressive or do you feel pretty confident that the farmer's market in 2019 is going to be there? I think it is, uh, it, is a, um, it is an aggressive schedule and I think that we have built in, I think, a fair amount of time in order to do it. But what is essential, and I guess the point that I would drive home, is that it is essential that it's a priority and that we stay on schedule and that we are designing and doing the stuff now. Um, that any delay would likely 
potentially impact that, but we did pad the schedule enough that we felt confident that 15 months would be sufficient. Um, and one thing I will note is that you'll see the construction schedule goes through the summer, um, which includes some of the rebuilding of sidewalks and things of that nature. So, you know, Washington will be done probably last, so at least Main Street will be ready to go um, in that time frame. But it is aggressive. So if the poles are coming out and we're doing um, new sidewalks and everything, are we doing new light posts too? It will all be the black light posts? Yeah. The yeah, everything will be built to our public area requirement standard. Yes. Yeah, so what you'll end up with at the end of this is a completed south downtown. I mean, it will be done. Um, just in time for us to start working on um, Coho Point. Um, and just briefly, phase 2.1, um, we expect to have to do a partial closure at the intersection of 21st and Washington to bring the storm sewer through the max tracks. We expect that that will be about a month um, and it will remain partially closed, but working with the assistant city engineer, we may be able to bore under the intersection, so we may not have to close that. So again, just kind of talking about the stuff early and coordinating has given us some ability to be flexible in how we do that. And so that's what we're aiming for, and we'll know more about that and keep you up to date. But um, worst case scenario is that we would have a closure that impacts that intersection for a month, and then that will be incorporated into any kind of traffic control plan that we have. And so obviously that can't happen when you've got Main Street. That's right. <laughs> That's why we called it 2.1, <laughs> <2 laughs> because we were like, how exactly is this all going to fit together? Yeah. We know it needs to be done, but again, we're it's really aiming. It's crazy that that didn't get done before light rail you know, was built. But we learned that when we started investigating what, what, what we're trying to implement here, so it was, it was yeah. a good lesson. Um, so, and then finally, the last phase is rebuilding of North Washington. So, we'll have Washington open one direction heading um, east um, throughout the construction. So, we would rebuild the south portion and then we would rebuild the north portion. Um, we expect that to take six months. Uh, again, rebuilding the streets and then rebuilding the sidewalks. Um, so basically, Washington and Maine um, are reopened fall of 2019 and completed um, late fall of 2019. And that's primarily Washington will be the last phase. Um, like I said, we're aiming to have the, the farmer's market in Main Street completely open and ready to go um, by March. We will not be building the sidewalks at this time for Coho because that site will be under construction and then we'll need to have a construction wall around that anyway. Um, but like I said, when we're underground and in the street, we'll be putting in the stub outs to serve that um, to serve that building as well. Um, so those will be completed with the project, and, and my hope is that will be um, about a year after this is done. So say again about Washington only being open eastbound? It will be open eastbound, one direction, for the duration of the construction of phase two. <coughs> for the 15 months? Yes. Wow. Wow. Why we're talking about this now. Yeah. Because um, one of the deal. main things that um, we want to be sure that we're doing, as I mentioned when I started off, is communicating this to the public. Right. So a big part of what we're doing here is, is to provide you an update, but to also, I think, um, really drive home the message that it's really important that we stay on schedule in order to meet these deadlines, and also so that we can collectively talk about this whole part of South Downtown with the community so that they know and can anticipate this and we're already talking about what kind of outreach um, we should be doing around that as opposed to just doing one-offs for all of the projects. Mm -hmm. Right. We're trying to really do this as a whole. So that makes and perfect sense. One of the other pro problems of course is, is Washington only has the left turn in. Right. Monroe doesn't. Right. So that was kind of our driving factor is to make sure that we keep access into the downtown area from Highway 99. Um, obviously there's going to be, have to be a lot of coordination with TriMet because there will be reconfiguration of bus lines as part of this and how they go through the site. So um, it is got a lot of challenges still ahead of us. As well, we and people like out. thinking about users that Milwaukee High School or St. John's who want to go out that way. Um, 
what they won't be able to. Yeah, they're going to have to go Washington, around to, to 224 or... To, or to Monroe and go down Monroe. You mean, go to, down Monroe. Will they be able to get to 21st to get to Monroe or they'll have to go up... Um, they'll have to go up to onto 27th or 28th. Whatever that is, yeah. right, and over, right. Yeah. Wow. We'll have detour setups and everything. So, I mean, that's... It's been really good that um, Layla's brought this up because it's gotten us to think about all the various things um, that are happening in this area. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's pretty impressive. Well, yeah, you definitely need to go to the historic Milwaukee neighborhood meeting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I mentioned yeah. this to them the last time I was there. Um, yeah. we, we hadn't shared the map with you. We hadn't really vetted a lot of the phasing. I feel like we're at a place now that we can start talking about this publicly. Um, we are going to be coordinating um, with uh, the Guardian team on on their site, so looking at the timing of their work. Um, we're setting up a meeting with Milwaukee High School and Northwest Housing Alternatives as well. We've been doing some outreach to them to also coordinate. Um, I think one of the outcomes that we would like to have is a coordinated traffic control plan for all of this. Um, it's ambitious. I would say, I would change my description, Councilor Adam, I would say this is an ambitious schedule. <laughs> um, we have to be very aggressive about how we implement it. Um, so we are trying to be very thoughtful about our partners and other folks that are doing this work and so that we're collectively as a city um, really doing the best job that we can to um, be coordinated and get this stuff done fast and, and you know, it's a lot in terms of um, I think Washington and Maine being closed for that long period of time, but it's only once, and then we're done. So that's that's the main idea behind doing this work. Um, so one of the key considerations um, that we wanted to talk with you about is really. Um, the next step. So we really need to move forward with this again to stay on that schedule. Um, so we are recommending that we move forward with the implementation strategy as presented. Um, you have a bond discussion coming up January 9th. Um, we have designed a farmer's market street that has a curbless plaza and that has uh, meets our current public area requirements. Um, so this is what the design is what's been adopted in our standards. Um, and again, we've been coordinating with them as well on what this looks like and um, I think that they're, they're happy with where things stand. Um, so this is certainly one of the main kind of key, I would say, the linchpin in this is this street and the street design. Um, so our recommendation is to move forward with, with this. It is funded, it is um, in the design standards, and I think reflects um, what we would like to see here. Um, when you say it's funded, you mean if it'll be in, it'll be in next year's budget. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It, has <laughs> adequate, it has adequate resources reserved. So. Yes. And we have found a way to make this work with all of the other discussions that we're having around downtown. It was the fourth priority for council when you were trying to determine what you wanted to achieve. And so it means that we're going with the design we've had instead of trying to redesign everything. But it does allow us to have a successful completion and a nice plaza that works for Farmer's Market at the completion of Coho. And that really has been, I think, your long-term goal is to create that at the right time in our process. And so I really have to hand it to staff that they sat down and figured out a way to do that with our existing funding. Mm -hmm. And we will be going out to the public um, once we get a contractor on board to help us with the finalizing of the design of the South Downtown Plaza. We know there's been a lot of heart put into that project. Um, and to give us some feedback on things like materials and other things um, that will then influence the final design and the construction documents for that. And it should be clear, this is not everything you wanted when this was designed several years ago. We are not cutting out buildings. So a section of the old design showed us actually taking on right of, uh, taking out components right. of private property and cutting buildings. You can see it at the top. We're not doing that in this oh, design. Okay. We are using okay. existing right of way mm -hmm. to create a project that looks similar without having those additional ramifications or costs so that we can get it done sooner. If council wants to delay, we can, but it means that we're going to install a street and then if you decide to come back and do it again, you're going to have to rip it out. But we yeah. can't, with the schedule that we've given you, we can't meet that original design. 
So our intention is to do as much of it as we could mm -hmm. with the money and the resources we had, knowing that you wanted to get something in and you wanted to be unique and a selling point of Milwaukee, but within the constraints we've got. <clears throat> Okay. Mm -hmm. Any concerns with that? Well, I mean, it all depends on, I mean, is there nothing in the circle down here? In so the circle is amenities? Yeah, so the circle is going to be pavers, mm -hmm. and it's going to look really nice, mm -hmm. and it's going to have the plugins, and it's going to have the water, and it's going to have the components that get us the, the design you want. What it doesn't do is it's not as large. There isn't an amphitheater in the design. It doesn't cut into the coho parcel. It doesn't do any of those sort of larger scale things that we had talked about. And it will be a curbless design. Uh -huh. So it'll be it'll be tabled. So it's it's a it's a traffic control thing. Mm -hmm. But it'll be tabled and it will be curbless. So that area will be a real gathering spot and it'll kind of just flow into the Adam Street connector. In the Adam Street and into Dogwood Park. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. You can see it sort of it's not the greatest image. You have one in your packet, but it does start to edge into there. And if funding becomes available, we'd be looking at doing the pavilion um, down south of that or west of that. Or you know, I would say that the um, having been on two iterations of the South Downtown Working Group, I would say the pavilion was the one thing that was never really baked or never really and maybe not even 100% consensus on, but the water feature was a thing that was uh, some kind of, of water feature thing that kids could play in, you know, that could be off, you know, but then be turned on, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing was kind of a pretty important part of And we can talk that. about that long term if yeah. we want to go into Dogwood Park right. or into the other components. Yeah. But there is zero chance yeah. that I can design that and that I can pay for that at this time. Yeah. I can't bring you a budget that gets you there and the schedule that Layla needs to hit in order to make this whole project design work. Yeah. That's why we called it out in the staff report, is because we can pull it, yeah. but we can't amend it. So I can either build it or I cannot build it, but I can't come up with additional revenue at this point and or redesign money in order to reconstitute what this thing looks like. And also remember, we are re-looking at the water feature across the street in Milwaukee Bay Park. Right. Yeah, which we to make it more attractive. Yeah. To make it more attractive and more usable than a right. static water feature. That was, so there's, there's other options within yeah. other parks in the immediate vicinity. Right. right. I am not saying it's perfect, though. No. And I understand that if we could, I would love to continue this dialogue, but with these two developments happening right now. Mm -hmm. I think you were right during your goal setting that this was the moment. Yeah. And this is what we have today that we can work with. So it's a question of is it, is it enough? And I think it gets you there with time, and I think it gets you consistency of design with the road, and I think you build out that section, and you come back in future years as we have funds available. But I can't come up with more right now. But that's, mm -hmm. that's why we're here. You guys can tell us that it's not enough. I guess my feeling is we need, we owe the people who spent a lot of time on that some kind of check-in with them. Okay on that before we just go, I feel like. I mean, there were, you know, like I said, two iterations of South Downtown working groups. I feel like we owe them a so check-in. Do those groups they exist? When you say check-in, how would you check-in? Public meeting. So not, not specifically for that work group, just in general? Well, I mean, I would certainly invite them, but it could be a wider yeah, public meter, meeting. It doesn't need to be limited to them, but I would specifically invite them, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and I probably have some old emails with <laughs> that Kenny Asher sent that have, you know, who his list was that I have to invite to those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm looking at Scott, and he can probably pull those, and I know the documents actually have the participant list that we can pull. And we can do that. I'll, I'm planning on saying it the way I just said it to you, though, <laughs> just so we're clear. Oh, you have to. Yeah, okay. You have to be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. Then a um, is this what you want? Mm -hmm. Right. Because right. we're talking about I mean, we have limited funds and we've got to make mm -hmm. this happen. And Lisa and I both voted for South Downtown to be one of our goals. So it's real important to me that this gets finished. But mm -hmm. I wasn't invested like Lisa and others were. Yeah. And I don't know if you were there well, for the South Downtown design. So I'm less invested. It's easier for me to make the let's move forward call than maybe someone who's. Yeah. And this doesn't suggest that a water feature is permanently off the table, yeah. right? I mean, this the, no, that no. can always get built back in, like you said, yeah. in, in Dogwood Park. or And so I think well, having We're this putting water lines into the road. We're putting in taps to the road. We're doing a lot of that work right now mm -hmm. for the farmer's market. We've been working with David Ashenbrenner and with others to make sure this works for that mm -hmm. purpose. So there are pieces in place. And my big thing is I just don't, I hate it when we rip up roads. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to rip it up a second time. Well, it would be intentional to do that. I agree. I mean, that, that's that's an enormous waste of resources. I mean, yeah. we have to build this out either way, and it makes absolutely no sense yeah. to do it twice. I mean, that to me, I think that, you know, as a council, uh, you know, on our budget committee, that absolutely is something that we have to be, you know, we, I think we should be able to say, let's, let's, let's engage folks and let them know that, you know, this isn't the end of the road for some of these features yeah, that were really absolutely. important to you, but it's our responsibility on council to do what is absolutely right. in the best interest of, you know, our, our, our funds. Well, in the moment in time. And yeah, exactly. And taking off and taking advantage of an opportunity that we have right now. So I am happy to do that. We'll do it as an informational piece. I'll start by doing a letter out to them that says we wanted to give you an opportunity. We'll hold a meeting and invite individuals to come talk about it and learn about kind of all the development that's happening in the region and mm -hmm. what that design now looks like. Um, Council can always reprioritize. You know, you can come back to me and tell me that you want to reprioritize components, but this is a lot of money. So. And if we start changing this design, everything you just saw doesn't work. Right. That time frame is too tight. So I can't say we're going to pull it out and have engineering sit down and look at this for two years and figure this out. There's just no time. So. Yeah. In all the projects that you went through and all the phases, we have funding for all this. this is not, we're not contingent upon anything. Is this would happen if we... As long as the development happens down at that site, yeah, some of that is based on PARs that we'll be getting from those developments. So there are parts of this that are based on private development. But what we're saying is with the intention that those have received approvals or that we're negotiating on those today and we believe that we have interested parties, we think this is your time frame. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure it wasn't contingent upon. And we're planning to green. Yeah. No, we're not waiting on that. And we're planning to make sure that everything between the curbs is is there. So the only thing we're really looking at is that work behind the curbs, the sidewalks and stuff in front of those buildings that are can't go in until the building's there. Um, those are the type of things that we have some coordination issues with. So we would have everything complete between the curbs as far as in the roadway structure and in the where most of the farmer's market is proposed to sit. And this turnaround, is this? Um, this. So uh, we've, uh, what, a year ago? I think this is one of the first yeah. meetings Chuck and I did. Uh, we you went were here for just like the same month, first month you were here. I know. We went and met with the post office. And what happens right now is people go down the wrong side of the road to yeah. drop off their mail. Exactly. We are going to get an accident. <laughs> so people come down and they swerve mm -hmm. to hit the mailbox uh, that's on that side of the road uh -huh. and they drop it off because they're driving. Yeah. So they want to use their hand uh -huh. to go into the box. It's really dangerous. Yeah. So when we were talking about this, the post office asked if we could please come up with a solution which would allow for both uh, a left hand drop off and a turnaround that was safe for them and for us. And so this was a solution to that that we think will work. And as, as a secondary thing, too, is when the farmer's market is there, that whole street's closed, obviously. Mm -hmm. So anybody coming from Lake uh -huh. has to be able to turn around to get back out. So, oh, I just guess I assume we'd close it all the way to Lake. But we're no, not. we have to keep you access to the post office. Federal right. building. <laughs> really? On yeah. Sundays? Yeah. Sundays really? a week. <laughs> that was part of the big <laughs> <laughs> Wow. 
just because they're not publicly open, they they're still, still open. They're still open. Yeah. So yeah. They're organizing and getting ready for the next week. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the and the PO boxes are there. People are going to pick yeah. up their mail. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 So I have one other question for you guys. Um, I since I'm new, I didn't even know about the water feature. Is there any other features that were talked about previously that's missing out of this design that I should have in the back of my head when I'm thinking about this? That, um, Namely for if we need to underground services in case there's a future hookup opportunity. Yeah. Um, and well, yeah, what's, is there something else there that's, you know, or is it just the water feature in this pavilion? I know that the amphitheater was talked about, um, but that's more of a space constraint with now Coho. Yeah, I didn't think amphitheater was really part of South Downtown. It was, you know, it was the riverfront. Um, here it was, um, you know, the ability to close the street, obviously, you know, we loved those like retractable automatic baller <laughs> things, you know. Um, water feature, no, I think. Those are the two. Those are the two. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, just my thought process on that was like, I mean, I, I love water feature, so I, I was like, yeah, let's put in a water feature, but we're also thinking maybe that's a phase three, and we, you know, right. we plan for it, but we don't actually build it until we're ready to do. We have fun. Yeah. You know, and a part of that is that a water feature like that also requires NCPRD to be at the table and to agree to that kind of expenditure because they maintain those for us. Um, we're talking about, I think he was saying something like 30000 but I want to be clear, like, I want to be really clear about what kind of money we'd be talking about in order to maintain that even. Uh, just because of the recirculation of the water, the chlorination that's required, you also don't want that dropping off in the Kellogg. There's a bunch of pieces that go into those. Sure. I love them. My daughter loves them. She would love nothing more than to have one of these on Main Street, but that's part of what we have to look at. Okay. Um. Before we finish, I just want to say that uh, the coordination is awesome, and I'm so glad that you guys are looking at this early. It's very helpful, and you're, I think you're doing just a wonderful job on looking at this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And also the way this was presented, with because uh, I'm a visual person as well, and the way you mapped it out and, and highlighted certain things, it was very easy to follow. So I yeah. appreciate the work you've done on this. It's really it helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think when you go out to public outreach, I think that's going to be very yeah. mm -hmm. appreciated and invaluable as well. And, um, for people, you know, I think when you just sort of have things listed out like that, you might not notice, ca you yeah. might not catch that, right. oh gosh, I mean, Lake Road neighborhood is going to be impacted by that right. as well because yeah. a lot of traffic will be diverted that way. So yeah. I think visually that helps people recognize the reality of, of what's coming to the situation. <laughs> it's interesting, years ago, um, several engineering directors back, one of the engineering directors said to me that I wasn't supposed to be cutting through on Washington, that I was supposed to take the dog leg or whatever he called it and go 224 till it ends and brings me on to 17 and then back to McLaughlin that way. I'm like, do you really think anybody does that? No, we all go on Washington. And this may be the time when we have to relearn our... <laughs> I might want to share that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, do you want to talk about oh, yeah. blue cards for me? Blue cards. So, Thanks just a brief update on blue cards. Um, so, apparently, we, we've lost one, the Caribbean theme. Oh, really? Yeah, they moved out October 30th. Um, but they've been advertising and soliciting some folks. There's a barbecue cart that may be interested. Um, the canopy tents are up, and the sidewalls have been approved, and so those will be installed soon. So what have been approved? Um, the sidewalls. The sidewalls. Oh, I don't so, know. So like that when you're in there. In the oh, for the tent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see. Over on the side of the tent. Um, and the cards are participating in the Christmas ships promotion. So Councilor Beatty and, and encouraged us to do uh, a little promotion. And so we've reached out to all the businesses in downtown, including the food carts, and encouraged those that were not open um, past 7 o'clock to stay open to maybe 9. And we got a handful of folks to participate. So we have these flyers you might have seen around. Um, and so the food carts would be participating in that as well. I think they're open until 9 o'clock. On most of those nights, which is maybe great. another one of the satellite bonfires. <laughs> so we've also I've had a conversation, and I don't know where it's at about whether or not we permanently have some sort of 
fire pit. Fire pit. Okay. Component to that oh. design. And um, when I've talked to the manager of the site, he said he was looking at it, okay. but I haven't heard where he's at on that. I like that. I was going to say, I saw at the, at the food cart pod in my hometown, they had just used one of those big horse stock tanks. Oh. It was great. It was like, oh, that's the easy, super easy fire pit right there. Yeah. They make good swimming pools, too. <laughs> they make good swimming pools, too. <laughs> so you can use it year-round. Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, and then finally, the other piece that uh, is that um, the high school students have been a really welcome addition uh, since since school has been back in session, and a number of the carts have added some lower cost options for oh, students. Nice. nice. So that's been nice. And um, yeah, and if so you want to have fun, go at lunchtime to see all the students, and you can tell which ones have added the lower cost ones <laughs> because they're that's where the lines are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lines. yeah. <laughs> Don't try and eat there. Well, and I was gonna say I went one day at like 1:30, thinking, oh, I'll miss the students. They'll be back at school. No. So their lunch hours must be really scattered because there were still a lot of students. Yeah. There at yeah. 1:30, yeah. or early release, probably. Maybe. I think they divide them up. Yeah. So that's that's all I've got. But it's there other than the one that left. The others are doing yeah. pretty well. You think, there's think still they're ten. Pretty... They said they're still doing okay. Um, the winter's tough time, so we should all be oh, yeah. out there. I go there at least once a week. Yeah. Sometimes three times a week. <laughs> but that's not about the cards. <laughs> not about the cards. Um, but yeah, it sounds like things are going well. We have the garbage situation under control. I was going to issue ask about that. Thank with you. that. Um, it was a it was a service pickup snafu, um, so that's been resolved. Yeah. And it's winter, so there are no bees. Bees. <laughs> yeah, true. Oh. Yeah. True. No loss. What's the capacity for food carts? Thirteen. Thirteen. We have ten now. We have ten. Left. Yeah. And I think that actually does not include the one that just left. So we have room for three more. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> That's we're, it. We're done early? We are. <laughs> Lisa, you're living up to the challenge. All right. Well, we'll adjourn now, and we'll be back in the regular session at 6 o'clock. Yeah. So, so carry that over to the regular session.